So hello, today we're going to talk about um, a book by Stephen King. It's called Salem's Lot and it is his second published novel and it was first published in 1975. Um, it was the second one that he um, published after Carrie, which was his debut ne novel. And um, I've never read Carrie and I've already said why I will never do it because I really do not need to follow the story of a girl who is so terribly abused um, and bullied by both her mother and her so-called school friends. I just don't need this anguish in my life, possibly also because it's a little bit very personal as well for me. So I'm like, I don't want to read it. I, I understand it's a brilliant novel and I've seen bits and pieces of uh, the movie as well, um, but it's just not something that I'm too interested in. Anyway, um, this is his second published novel um, and I'm going to talk about it, but there will be references or there may be references to other works by Stephen King. So there will be spoilers obviously for Salem's Lot, but maybe also for other pieces of his uh, work that I have read. So if you know about King, if you have read lots of his books then please stay if you haven't and you don't want to be spoiled having said this he's been active since 1970 something so his career is spanning almost 50 years at this stage so um i suppose uh you know if you're still being spoiled by certain things about him you know it's maybe a little bit late to the to the party in a way so um salem's lot is a book where we see a lot of things that have become typical of our Stephen King. We also see a first mention of his multiverse, which um, is which unfolds in his later work. Now, like most of his books, this book is set in uh, New England. Um, and we also see for the first time, because I don't think this is a thing in Carrie, but this is probably the first time that he has written a book with a protagonist who is himself a writer. Now, this is something that happens in lots of King's books, even, and especially, for example, in The Dark Half, where this is, where this is a big part of the story. Um, but also, obviously, in the Dark Tower series, where in the last two volumes, I believe, or at least in the very last one, he has actually written himself under the name Stephen King and a writer into the book itself, which is kind of like an Ouroboros thing, you know, the the, um, the eternally um, self-devouring snake. Um, and... It is, again, a story about a writer who is trying to come to grips with certain problems. His wife has died in a, in, a, in a motorcycle accident where he was riding the bike, but it wasn't his fault at all. There was no, um, no one ever thought it was his, his fault. It was really the fault of the, of the other guy in the truck and his wife dies. Um, and he basically decides to go back to um, the place where he spent part of his childhood after his mother's death. He went to live in Jerusalem's lot, also known as Salem's lot, um, to stay with his aunt for a couple of years. And there he got fascinated with a house called the Marston House. Now, this house is called Marston House because it was built by um, Hughie Marston, who basically seems to have been some kind of mafia hitman but he was so weird and so brutal and possibly also already a murderer of children that even the mafia was like okay hands off this guy is too much so they basically at least this is how i interpreted the text um basically said okay marston leave us don't we don't want anything to do with you here's money just settle down somewhere and we tie, we, we, we loosen all of our ties and, you know, like no hard feelings, blah, blah, blah. And he and his wife retire to Salem's lot. He builds this house. And while he is there, 
uh, children vanish. Um, nobody ever says, oh, it's him who kills them or they what were killed, but they vanish. You know, there's talk about quicksands and stuff, you know, around the around the town. Um, now, I didn't really research if quicksands are a thing in in Maine, but um, maybe maybe they are. Anyways, um, one day uh, people find his dead body. He's hanged himself on the first floor of the building. So in America, this would be the second floor. And they find his wife terribly mutilated the way it seems and he must have done unspeakable things to her but also dead um, and he's killed himself and um, when he was a child Ben Mears so basically the um, the um, the protagonist uh, went into that house on a dare and um, believes that he saw the ghost of of of, of um, Mr. Marston hanging from the raft. So he has kind of like this this um, this vision of the dead body. Of course, it wasn't the case. And he then, at some point, leaves um, the place as well before the Great Fire, um, and moves away from our J um, Salem's lot. And later on, he returns to write a book about this house and he arrives and he's even thinking you know like it might be a good idea to actually rent the place so that he kind of can live there maybe on the ground on the ground floor just maybe renovate one or two or three rooms you know not even go upstairs but you know just live on the ground floor and he comes to the real estate agent of the town and he says well you I would like to rent this house and he's like no no it's already been sold um, because the um, the real estate guy has sold it to um, two gentlemen, only one of whom, Mr. Straker, he has actually met, um, uh, who want to move to um, to uh, Salem's Lot and to open an antique store. So again, there is this idea of an old gentleman having a w really weird um, shop, like, you know, antiques, but when it's finally opened and it's described, yes, there are antiques there, but to me, it's more like an emporium. It does remind me a little bit of needful things. And again, you've got this older guy who's running the shop and, you know, um, in a small town. And, um, and then of course, uh, stuff needs to be moved to the house. And, um, uh, basically a couple of boxes are moved as well. And then things start to happen. So, um, first of all, the Glick brothers die. So they're friends with um, Matt Petrie, um, somebody who is a boy who has recently moved to town with his parents, or at least this is how I interpret it. He doesn't seem to have been there all the time, but only moved there recently. And um, there is two, the brothers Glick, um, and they're not Jewish. There's a point made about this. They're actually Italian. Um, and one of them dies. And the other one is basically found later. But unfortunately, the young boy didn't just die. He was killed by a vampire. And that becomes very, very quickly apparent for anybody who's ever read Dracula. And Dracula, the book, is mentioned in this book as well and referenced. Because... Um, he comes back and floats in front of his brother's um, uh, window and um, the brother opens and basically um, then ends up in hospital with acute anemia and then later on also dies and people start dying. People first start vanishing, but then they come back or they come um, into, let's say, um, into the vicinity of friends of theirs, they go to the pub or whatever, and they seem to be very, very ill, you know, weak, pale, they don't like the sunlight anymore. And Ben, the protagonist, um, notices this as well. And um, he's also, he also falls in love with um, a young woman from the town. Um, much to her mother's um, disapproval, but very much to her father's delight because he gets on really well with um, with Ben. Um, and basically, Ben is beginning to realize that something's going on. And he is also beginning to form this idea of 
there's a vampire here. This is so much like vampires. It has to be true. And I mean, you know, Occam's razor. It's the simplest explanation that is usually the correct one. If you for a second uh, will accept and um, suspend your disbelief that vampires exist. And he's, he forms an alliance with a local school teacher and a, um, a local doctor and they start investigating. So, for example, there is the dead body of Mrs. Glick and um, because she also dies at some point and she's in the morgue and they basically decide to go into the morgue. They manage to go in there because um, the doctor is friends with the funeral home owner, the Jewish funeral home owner, um, because he had once saved his son from drowning, I believe. So basically they then spend the night there. And then, of course, Mrs. Glick gets up and she tries to um, she tries to attack them. Um, and they basically use a makeshift cross and and um, send her on her merry way. She she survives, or well, she remains undead. They don't they don't destroy her, but she basically leaves them alone. And so the story unfolds, and it is a story. And here we come back to um, this is a typical Stephen King. It's a story about people. First and foremost, I have come to appreciate the fact that. Stephen King is an exceptionally intelligent author and perceptive and empathetic author when it comes to describing human beings. He is able to characterize poignantly, most poignantly, any side character in just a couple of sentences, sometimes even just a couple of words, that you can imagine exactly what this person is like and they all make up the fabric of this town and then you sense how this fabric is beginning to unravel because of the vampire that has come to town and the way the book is structured is that um, the different people in the story, the main characters, get different chapters. And they're then also called Ben 1, Susan 1, and so on and so forth. And then Salem's Lot, the town itself, gets a character. It becomes a character itself. And he basically takes us through the town. And it's day. So it's like... Um, Salem's lot, five o'clock in the morning. Okay, so what happens at five o'clock? So there's the there's the farm, and there's a giant farm, and he's the farmer has I think two sons, and basically what happens? You know, they milk the cows and that kind of thing. So basically, the town watches as its inhabitants start to wake up and go about their business, and um, it is incredible the way he tells the story because yes the vampires are important and the vampires basically spread like wildfire they cannot contain them they um everyone gets infected at some point and at some point um you you take the perspective of you basically zone in on on a couple of um, individuals. So basically, there's the hunchback that runs the local waste dump, and he's totally kind of in lust with this, I would say, late teenage girl. She's still at school who, according to him, doesn't wear a bra because she's trying to turn him on. Um, probably she doesn't care about him at all because he's old he's a hunchback he's like i mean this is jailbait she's probably not interested in him at all she's probably not wearing a bra but not because of him but because she decides not to um and basically he's really lusting after and you kind of go okay this is unhealthy and then he is turned by the vampire but the vampire is like well i know what's going on you know you really want her blah 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 don't you you know and she's mocking you yeah and he's like yeah and i really want her and that kind of thing and he's like well you shall have her and he turns him and then later on she is turned into a vampire as well we don't see that that happens off the page as it were but then Basically, there is this little side note where she says, and now that she, where it says, now that she's a vampire, she's actually not not very unhappy about his advances. So it seems like she and the hunchback have hooked up in their now undead state and are basically, you know, living together in an icebox. I believe. I think that they're they're basically living in an old fridge, 
well, one of those huge fridges uh, on the on the scrapyard where he worked. So basically, that's where they spend their days, and at night they go out. Um, and then you know, you just have so many different people, and they are described, and their lives are dissected and laid open for us, so that we kind of empathize with them or we dislike them, but. It is a living, breathing city that is slowly being turned into a society of vampires. Now, it never happens that you come to think about what's going to happen if they, if basically everybody has been eaten. Will they then start spreading? Probably because they will have to feed. There are some people who realize that something weird is going on. They may or may not accept what they're seeing, but they basically just close up shop and leave. So for example, the sheriff decides, okay, I'm done with this. He gets in a car, he drops his sheriff's star, he drops his weapon on his and his keys on the on the desk in his sheriff's office and he just drives off. And he's like, I'm not I'm not doing anything with this. I'm done. And basically the the protagonists are trying to to curb this um, vampire disease as it were and they basically know that if you if you if you put a stake through their hearts and even better still cut off their heads you know a vampire will actually die forever and be be done with um and so they basically decide to take um the woodworking tools of the father of one of the victims um and um make stakes but they kind of like realize that this is a this is not even a last ditch effort because there is no way that in the time that they have until the sun goes down, they will be able to make enough stakes and then stake everybody while it's still daylight. So they know that this is not going to happen. And it's just kind of like this, this um, uh, fruitlessness and this futility of it all, but they keep doing it. So it's like, this is, this is like an anti hero thing you know that you're going to lose you know that you you should actually leave to fight um, another day you know staying here and trying to stake as many people as you can it's not going to work because you are not going to win um but they keep doing it um they keep working at making stakes and then in the end they actually catch the head vampire and they kill him unfortunately ben's ben's girlfriend has also been been um been turned so he gets to kill her as well or send her to heaven or whatever you want to call it so a very tragic thing and he and uh, mark petrie basically then leave the town together and they start basically a, a vagrant life and they travel to mexico and this is actually also where the book starts because the book starts with the man and the boy um living in in mexico you know or being on a road trip and doing odd jobs and um then living in mexico and then uh, also uh, getting uh, holy water and and realizing that they're being followed because the problem is that the vampires are following them and it is their mission now to kill them and to destroy them where they find them but they're also being followed and you know may be found by them and um there there are like i said a lot of things that remind me of later books by Stephen King. So, for example, there is this man-boy connection, which we also see in The Gunslinger, where we have um, Roland and the young Jake, only with the difference that Roland actually kills Jake because he wants to meet the man in black, and he can only do this if he sacrifices Jake. So there is no sacrifice, sacrifice here. But for a while, Jake and Roland team up to travel. Um, but, of course, um, uh, ben and his young charge also team up. There is also this um, idea of this love relationship, and I want to say it's totally platonic. I want to emphasize this, but it is this idea of they are forced together and they go through so many terrible things together that they just, you know, he needs this son figure and the son needs a father figure and... Um, uh, and that's also something that you see between Jake and Roland in The Gunslinger. 
there is even a character who later apparently appears in the Dark Tower series. I haven't gotten to that part yet, but Doc, uh, but um, Father Callahan, the parish priest, has a run-in with the head vampire and fails. His belief isn't strong enough and he is broken and he runs. He leaves his charges behind. He leaves his flock behind. He just basically gets on a bus and leaves. I mean, for, for that, that's a total disaster for a, for a Catholic priest or for any priest to stand in front of the unholy, fail the test, and then not only fail the test, because, well, when your faith is tested, you may fail, but to actually abandon ship and just say, well, you know, I'm out of here. And he gets on a bus and he leaves. And apparently he later reappears in the Dark Tower. Um, and of course, you have... Maine, you have New England. That's um, one of the one of the staples of um, of Stephen King, um, and you also have, um, I would say, and again, you have the the author, of course, um, and I think you can see the seeds for other towns that he's going to create later in life, like Castle Rock, also like Derry, which is the place where it takes place and Derry is also mentioned in for example uh, the storm of the century which is not a book by Stephen King but a screenplay that he wrote and um, so you can already see the foundations that he's laying there maybe he knew maybe he didn't because apparently he's not a great plotter in terms of that he has this big plot that he writes and um, so basically as he was writing the Dark Tower series he didn't know how the series was going to end. He was plotting from chapter to chapter. So, um, and the question is, of course, uh, basically he, he later returns to Jerusalem's lot, to Salem's lot. He wrote um, a couple of uh, short stories and um, he uh, never actually left it completely, although this is a self-contained book. You can read this, as a book by Stephen King. You don't need to read anything else by him. You don't have to have read anything else by him in order to understand it. When we think of Stephen King as the king of horror, it isn't particularly horrific. So um, the dog dies. That's important to note. The dog dies, just like in many of his books. In Dead Zone, the dog also dies. And then people get turned by vampires. There is um, a scene where um, a guy whose wife cheats on him mock executes her lover. They ba he basically catches the two of them in bed and then he beats up his wife. And then there's a very laconic sentence later in the book, uh, which again brings us back to the true evil is human beings. And he's like, and he rapes her on that night and then any con every consecutive night. So basically this guy chooses to do evil every day. Um, so that's also a typical King where he says, you know, this happens. And he basically is somebody who writes about abuse of women at the hands of men in very many contexts. And he's always very critical of it. So it's not like he's like, oh yeah, well, men are like this, but he really takes a stand um, and he makes a point of this topic as well. Um, and we we have to remember, this is 1975. I mean, he basically lays it bare. There is abuse in the family and women are at a high risk at home. Um, he also uh, lays bare the open homophobia of the time. And um, basically the, the vampire and his, his, his ghoul, as it were, to talk about World of Darkness, Mr. Straker. Basically, the two of them move into the Marston house. Nobody ever sees the man. Um, or if they do, then they die. Um, and everybody's kind of like, you know, talking about them like they're this gay couple, but not in very many good words. So they're really, but it's like this, this normal homophobia. And he makes it clear that this is not on, that somebody gets killed because they're gay. Stephen King is not down with that. He also picks this up in it later. He really puts a finger on this kind of un, 
this this kind of behavior that he really does not approve of and he basically makes takes a stand there so in 1975 to talk like this and to be so opposed to this and to lay it bare and to say well this is what american society is like there is abuse in the house there is homophobia and it's not good you know for his second novel he wasn't a made man yet he wasn't a, a you know like somebody who who can say lots of things because they know that they have millions and millions in the bank. That's quite impressive. If you like um, vampire novels, then I think this book is for you. If you like Stephen King, but you like him because of it, I would say you're probably going to be disappointed in this book because it is very low key. There is zero horror there is also only very limited action and it is all about people it's all about the connections between people and one of the things that i found also very interesting is his laconic remark as the book progresses and more and more people are turned and it's coming to the time when Tonight, they will be out in force and they will be roaming the streets. There is kind of like this moving out and looking down on the town. And he says, the last people to stay human were the ones that didn't have any friends and no family. They were the loners. And why is that? Because nobody, because when they realized that stuff was happening, people wouldn't open their doors anymore. And if you don't have any family and if you don't have any friends, there is no one that you need to open your door for. If you have friends, if you have family, then, you know, just locking out your dead son is something you can do, but it's going to be difficult. Locking out your dead mother is going is something you can do, but it's going to be difficult. But if you don't know anyone, if you have no ties, if you are this lonely person that we would all feel sorry for because they have no one to connect to. They are the ones that actually survive. And I thought this was, um, it made me really sad in a way. I cheered for them because they were the ones who are going to probably survive if they don't cave. But um, and if they manage to make a decision to leave the town and some people do leave the town because there is information about um, how people um, were approached by um, uh, people from from the press to talk about Salem's lot. And some of them just basically said, no, I'm not going to talk about it. One of them moved to California and so on and so forth. But those w would be the people who would survive. So in a way, if, if there is a vampire apocalypse, if you are a person who doesn't have any friends and no family, you're the least likely to fall because you will not be swayed into inviting them in. So that's Stephen King, Salem's Lot, 1975. Um, you can easily get it. Um, I actually read it in German and I've got an English illustrated um, uh, copy here, which I only got a couple of um, weeks ago. And it also contains a couple of um, short stories that deal with Salem's Lot to a certain degree, um, One for the Road, Jerusalem's Lot and Deleted Scenes. I haven't read this yet or these yet, but I will. But I hope you enjoyed this and um, thanks for listening. Bye.